Ready? Okay, we're rolling. John Bush. Do you want me to look at you or the camera? Um, you're going to address me. <clears throat> so what we've done with um, most people, in a sense it actually helped that I hadn't uh, seen them do their uh, presentation because um, I was able to kind of get it fresh here. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you can kind of give a, a basic overview of, uh, of what it is you came tonight to talk about. Uh, sure. Well, I was here tonight to convey the message that in order to be more free, we need to take the responsibility of our freedom into our own hands and not abrogate that responsibility to government. And uh, one of the sacred cows that I touched on was the idea that the Constitution actually didn't create more freedom than there existed before in America with the Articles of Confederation. The Constitution even can be considered a constitutional coup d'etat in that it was passed unconstitutionally according to the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they were only there to amend the Articles of Confederation, not even institute an entirely new form of government, which among the powers granted to the Congress, a small group of individuals, a uh, power that they were granted over a massive geographic area, was the power to collect and lay taxes, the power to borrow money to take out credit on the United States of America, which is the American people, essentially gave them the power to take out loans on behalf of the people, Additionally, the power to call up the militia to dispel insurrections or rebellions. Uh, essentially, it was a indiv class of individuals that created an institution to cement their own position of privilege in society. And not only that, but a lot of people are concerned with the NDAA, the Indefinite, uh, indefinite Detention of Americans, uh, which in order to do that, of course, you have to do away with the individual's right to habeas corpus. And what is actually written into the Constitution is Congress has the power to suspend habeas corpus uh, if there is an invasion or an insurrection and they deem it to be against public safety. So the only difference between that essentially and, and the most blatant parts of the uh, NDAA is that the powers is given to the president with NDAA. With the Constitution it's given to a small body of men whom have never been accountable to the people. They never will, were accountable. I don't think they ever will be accountable. Additionally, government has never been about protecting the rights of the minority or the rights of the individual. It has never been about protecting the life, liberty, and property of the individual. Just the opposite, it's always been about violating the life, liberty, and property of the individual to benefit the few at the expense of the many. And unless, again, you're a small, you know, the one percenters as the Occupy movement would say, government's not protecting your life, liberty, and property. In fact, it's doing just the opposite. Good. Um, the uh, um, another thing that we're trying to get up convey is this uh, sense that uh, something such as the liberty movement or whatever you're going to sort of use as a larger umbrella mm -hmm. designation is uh, is is bringing a little bit more variety of people to it. And and for someone who has no problem calling himself an anarchist. Uh, can you kind of give us a little bit of that side uh, as opposed to some of the people that uh, might be more comfortable labeling themselves as, as libertarians? I'm not sure if I follow you. Um, the, it's uh, just, I, just a question of self-identity, I guess, as, as okay. more than anything else. Uh, so a lot of people identify a group, uh, the, the liberty movement or the freedom movement, and there's a diverse group of individuals and belief systems that make up this movement uh, from Tea Party constitutionalists to anarcho-capitalists to libertarians to paleoconservatives uh, to old right classical liberals uh, to kucinich style Democrats even participate in the freedom movement. But I think the one thing that unites us at least in rhetoric, unfortunately not always in application, uh, is our common bond to the non-aggression principle, essentially the idea that it's immoral to force people to do things. Now I would hope that people who define themselves as being part of the liberty movement would accept differences uh, in different belief systems of other individuals and respect their rights to be different 
uh, as long as they don't impress themselves upon other individuals and as long as they don't force their belief system upon others. And that's why I think the liberty movement is growing and thriving and flourishing and why so many individuals and groups with such diff diverse backgrounds and belief systems can work together, united for a common cause. And, you know, there's a lot of dichotomies, left versus right, Republican versus Democrat, 1% versus 99%. But I think the ultimate dichotomy that unites the liberty movement is the productive class versus the parasitic class. The parasitic class being the political class, those who use government in order to further their own ends at the expense of others. Government only exists because it takes from other people. It doesn't exist of its own fruition. It doesn't actually provide value in society. It actually takes value away. Uh, on the contrary, the productive class is out there uh, using peace and voluntary associations and contracts and exchanging and building value, building community, building business agree agreements, business arrangements, and fulfilling the demands of individuals uh, without forcing something down their throat. So I would hope that the liberty movement would unite uh, behind that common creed that we, the productive class, want the parasitic class off of our backs. And then once that happens, I would hope that the uh, productive class would be able to go about their business without wanting to force anything upon other individuals. But the problem that we see, of course, is there's many people in the liberty movement who define themselves as libertarians who in their own lives reject libertarianism. And one of the problems that I find, uh, and it's, uh, I don't fault people for this, because uh, I fear government uh, repression myself, and it's easy to say that we're not afraid of it, but uh, you know, my heart skips a beat when I'm driving home, even sometimes when I'm not doing anything wrong, uh, when I see a police officer because I don't want to be pulled over, I don't want to end up in a cage. And uh, I know that I'm going to stand up for my rights, and it could potentially wind me up in a cage because I'm not willing to lay down. Um, but I would hope people begin to see that every time they pay their income taxes, and every time they even buy something here in the great state of Texas with an 8.25% general sales tax, they are funding their own oppression. They're funding my oppression, and I hope people start to see that. Uh, and that's why a lot of my talk focused on the idea that we ought to build uh, competing institutions of defense and mutual defense compacts in order to empower ourselves to stand up to a very scary, tyrannical, and powerful government. We all need to know that individuals of a like mind have each other's back. Okay. I, that sort of ties into a lot of what we've been sort of working with in some of these interviews, and I think you've got some really strong points you hit upon. And, um, so I, I think that I guess all we need. Cool. It's really good. Thanks so right much. On.